You are listening to C-Suite Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to C-Suite Perspectives, a signature series by the Conference Board. I'm Alex Heil, Senior Economist at the Conference Board and guest host of today's episode. In today's conversation, we'll discuss the latest U.S. Consumer Confidence Index, as well as our outlook for the global economy. Joining me today is Dana Peterson, Chief Economist and Leader of the Economy, Strategy and Finance Center at the Conference Board. Welcome, Dana. Hello, Alex. So let's start with the Consumer Confidence Index. What is the biggest takeaway from the September survey release? Maybe you can tell us more about that first. Absolutely. So U.S. consumer confidence dipped in the month, and it's actually at the bottom of the range that we've seen it moving in over the last couple of years. And the key issue among consumers was the labor market. So even while most people are working, the unemployment rate is low, consumers are still hearing bad news in in the news about the labor market. Certainly the fact that um, we're seeing smaller jobless claims, the unemployment rate did tick up from last year. And I think all those things are kind of weighing on sentiment. And so uh, it, it definitely uh, jives with uh, the sentiment out of the Fed, where the Fed believes that the labor market is strong right now, but they are concerned about realization of downside risks to the labor market. And certainly their 50 basis point cut to interest rates in the last week um, underscores that concern about realization of downside risks, even though the labor market right now is fine. So it's really a consistent story. If you look at the Consumer Confidence Survey and you know, related to the most recent labor market information that we received, right? It's It really seems like sentiment on the consumer side reflects some of the slowing in the labor market. Is that is that a true statement? Well, I would say it reflects some of the, yes, some of the, the slowing in the labor market. But again, we have to remember the labor market is going from raging to more balanced. So after the pandemic, when 20 million people were let go, companies had to bring people back to the labor force. It took about three years to do that. And when you're trying to fill up a bathtub, if you think of the labor market as a bathtub, you need to run the faucet really hard to fill it up. But at this point, I think the bathtub is full, so you don't need to run the faucet as hard. What is that faucet? Job additions on a monthly basis. So you don't need 200, 300,000 jobs added per month when you're pretty much at full employment. And so, I mean, that's that's something that, you know, I've been trying to help <laughs> convey that message to help people. That's not that the labor market is weak because there's something wrong with the economy. It's because we're coming off of a period where we had to hire a lot of people to replenish the workers that were let go during the pandemic. So that's that's where we are right now. And indeed, the Fed has said that the labor market in the U.S., is more balanced. And indeed, when the unemployment rate was below where it is now, the Fed deemed it to be generating inflation. And the goal of interest rate hikes over the last few years has been to bring inflation back down to the 2% target. So I think, you know, again, consumers are hearing things in the news, um, but only part of the information. And indeed, their own situation is that they are working. (laughs) They probably will continue to work because when we ask CEOs of the largest companies, do you plan to let people go? And they continue to say no. So as long as consumers are working, then um, we probably shouldn't have to worry about a recession that's driven by, you know, weak demand, as opposed to some new shock. Right, that's, that's a good point. So thanks for sort of unpacking, especially the headline numbers there. If we dive a little bit deeper into, you know, the most recently published data, can we differentiate by age or by income what this um, the CCI really tells us here? Sure. So when I look at age, it's the case that people who were under 35 generally are more optimistic. I guess that makes sense. You probably have fewer responsibilities um, other than student loans. You probably have fewer bills, that sort of thing. So it, it's still that case. And indeed, in the month, we saw a little bit of an uptick in people 35 and under in terms of their confidence and a downtick among people who are over 35. But even still, in general, when we look at all different ages over the last year or so, confidence has been 
slowing. It's still positive, but it's not as um, ebullient as it was earlier this year or even late last year. And that's true for that's true for any group, essentially. That's true across the board, right? Yes, for all age groups. And by income, it's we only had one income group that saw an uptick in the month in uh, September, and that was persons making between seventy five thousand and under a hundred thousand dollars. But on balance, all the income groups are are behaving in the same way um, as the age groups are, where um, consumer confidence is still positive, but it's less robust than it was. Right. Okay. So if if we put sort of a time perspective on this, and we're now, you know, if we can focus on the present situation versus expectations gauge, has there been, um, you know, how would you describe the sort of the, the movement in those two patterns? And how does that roll up to the headline number? Sure. So as you mentioned, the headline number is a combination of two measures, and each of those two measures are a combination of several others. In total, there are five measures that we put together to create the headline. So as I said, the headline has been moving sideways for the last two years. And indeed, the, the latest reading in September was kind of at the bottom of that range. But when you look at the details, it's, it is the case that the current situation um, has been weakening in terms of uh, consumer views. It's still very positive. The measure's at 120. And um, post-pandemic, it peaked at like 160. And just before the pandemic, it was around, you know, 180. But even still, like 120 is a very strong reading, but we've moved down from those very uh, super strong readings um, for the present situation. And when it comes to expectations, um, expectations have been moving back and forth over 80. So any uh, reading, uh, they've been moving back and forth and oscillating around 80. So if the expectations gauge is above 80, usually consumers are not anticipating recession. If it's below 80, consumers do. And like I said, it's been oscillating around that point for literally the last uh, two or three years. Um, but in the month, definitely we saw both the present situation and the expectations gauges move downward. Most of the decline was in the present situation. It fell by about 10 points. And it was a case that, yes, business conditions were a little bit negative, but it was more so that the labor market differential, which is the difference between jobs easy to get versus jobs hard to get, shrunk. And that's been coming off again for the last two years. It's still positive, but for the most part, consumers are saying right now it's not as easy to find a job. But I would again say that, you know, if you go back to 2022, you had massive numbers of job openings. The JOLTS data showed that job openings were almost uh, uh, you know, several million above where we were in 2019. And as companies hired people, those job openings have shrunken. So certainly for the person who hasn't found a job yet, there aren't as many openings. Um, but it also depends upon the industry you're looking at. Some industries are experiencing labor shortages and other industries are actually um, doing a little bit of downsizing. So, but all in all, like I said, the labor market differential is positive, but it's not as positive as it was. And that certainly is what weighed on the, the measure in the month. Right. That is helpful. And it certainly is a nuanced story. So what about, this is a sort of a rich and deep data set. So what about some of the, the write-in comments? What about the specific perspective that some consumers might have shared with us here on, you know, let's say the future of inflation or or maybe even the most recent um, Fed policy change, which clearly um, is, is a going to be affecting all sorts of different areas of the economy? Sure. So the right in question is basically, what do you what are you thinking about that is having a big impact on the economy? So it's not really, you know, a concern or or the opposite of that. It's not really saying things are good or bad. They're just saying, well, this right now is we think is having a big impact on the economy. It could be positive or negative. So it's still the case that consumers are highlighting prices as having a big impact on the economy. And act second to that is inflation. Um, and then things like gas prices and and um food prices, groceries. 
So the difference between prices and inflation is price, the price is the level, right? So bread is $10, right? Inflation is the rate of change in that price. So a few years ago, maybe bread was five bucks. Now it's 10. So that's inflation. So uh, for a long time, consumers were complaining about inflation. Prices are rising too fast. Now prices are rising at a much slower pace, but the level is still high. <laughs> it's expensive. Bread is expensive. So consumers are still focused on that, but less on the rate of change in prices, but more on the price level. But what also popped up that was interesting in the, the write-ins was comments about politics and the election and also comments about interest rates. But again, it's not whether it's good or bad. It's just that this is just what you know the chatter brought up. But certainly when we look at interest rates, um, we do ask consumers, what do you think about interest rates um, you know, six to 12 months from now? And for the most part, they anticipate that interest rates are gonna fall. Now, I think this survey was closed just before the Fed meeting. So I would imagine in you know future readings, October, November, going forward, that consumers are gonna uh, have more intense views that interest rates are gonna fall. And when it comes to at least the election write-ins, there's still not as many write-ins as we saw, you know, certainly for the 2020 elections or even the 2016 election. So consumers are a little bit focused, but they're not saying that it's having a mega impact on the economy just yet. That's probably going to change in October because that's when typically consumers and households get really involved in thinking about the election because they're just getting ready to vote. Right. So the availability of data at different points in time makes a difference in terms of how consumers form their own beliefs and expectations. That's true. So if we're looking forward, what does is, what is this survey tell us about, you know, household spending in terms of, you know, what are, the, what, are the, what are the likely plans that consumers might follow? Is there going to be an emphasis on more durable goods purchases? What about services? I mean, what is... What's what can we what can we glean from this this data set that would help us understand this a little bit better? Yeah, so um, we have a new question where we ask consumers, uh, "Do you plan to buy a big ticket item?" So it's kind of like yes or no, and then if they say yes, then we give them a laundry list and they can pick. Well, I'm gonna choose. I'm I might buy these things, right? Um, or nothing listed here or something I want to buy. But at least we capture yes, I plan to buy something. So for example, we don't have like yachts or, <laughs> or like jet skis, but we'll capture that in the big ticket item, even though we don't have that as a list and the list. And it is the case that consumers are still looking to buy durable goods, but it's certainly not as strong as we saw during the pandemic. Um, and the things that consumers are looking to buy in terms of those big ticket items are cars. So we've definitely seen a pickup since over the last year in desires to purchase autos. And I think uh, a lot of that's because you know, certainly in the midst of the, of the pandemic, there wasn't enough inventory and prices were too high. Now we're seeing auto prices fall um, in both the CPI measure and the personal consumption expenditure deflation measure. So people are jumping on that and saying, okay, well, now's my, my chance to um, buy a car because cars are cheaper. And then now I think going forward, we're going to see uh, expectations for buying a car to rise because interest rates are going to be falling. So not only is the price of the car lower, but I can finance it for less. Um, when it comes to homes, uh, there's really not much appetite at all to buy a home. And that's understandable. You know, home prices are still elevated and mortgage rates are still higher than what people are used to. But certainly as the Fed <laughs> continues to cut rates, and indeed mortgage rates have come off a little bit, even ahead of the Fed rate cut that's anticipation and they're going to continue falling we think that you know certainly the existing housing market will loosen up because the reason why there's no existing housing inventory is because if you own a home and you have you refinance during the pandemic you've got a two and a half percent mortgage you certainly don't want to trade that in for seven and a half percent mortgage if you move so we need mortgage rates to come off so right now people are not really looking to buy uh homes when it comes to other things like uh, appliances, um, it's been pretty flat in terms of desire. Um, so we haven't really seen a big tick up in that, but certainly consumers are still really excited about buying technology, especially smartphones and PCs and laptops. So that's exciting. Um, when it comes to services, um, we've, we usually canvass people about services twice a year, but now we're gonna canvass them every month. 
And certainly in September, it's still the case that people are interested in travel, um, you know, getting on a plane, going to a hotel uh, and restaurants, eating out. But once they get to their destination, they're not interested in going to the amusement park or the historic sites, right? They're just kind of sheltering in place during travel. Um, and so that's still the case that we're seeing here. Um, what was interesting is that in the past, we've noticed that consumers were preferring to stream over movies, right? So streaming is cheaper. You can do that from home. The whole family can enjoy movies. It's like a hundred bucks or more for a family to go. Um, and it's still the case that they prefer to stream over movies, but movies have moved up. So I think that's great for the, you know, for, you know, Hollywood, certainly that consumers are suddenly more interested in going to the movies, um, which is something that, you know, we really haven't done that much of since the, the pandemic. So that's good news. But it's also the case that consumers are planning to spend, continue to spend more on things that they need in terms of services, like, like healthcare, utilities motor vehicle services, you know, things like insurance. So that's not different. Um, so I think that you know, consumers are being pretty consistent. They still want to get out there and travel, but they're not interested in spending too much money on a men on activities once they travel. And they're also more keen to spend on non-discretionary types of services over discretionary types of services. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, it's it's fascinating to see how some markets have really been, um, you know, while while current decisions are largely driven by also current economic conditions and the outlook, but some are still affected by what happened during the pandemic, like movie theaters and cars certainly come to mind. We're going to take a short break and be right back with more of my conversation with Dana Peterson. What does the future of work mean for your employees? How will your company navigate ESG? Will there be a global recession? At the Conference Board, our experts translate the latest research and economic analysis into insights and real-time problem solving for your organization. Membership at the Conference Board provides your team with an assortment of knowledge from economics, marketing and communications, ESG, public policy, and human capital. As a member, you'll have access to our center experts, member-exclusive events, data and benchmarking tools, and peer sharing that will help you understand the present and shape the future. Consider becoming a Conference Board member today by visiting www.conference-board.org. Welcome back to C-Suite Perspectives. I'm Alex Heil, Senior Economist at the Conference Board. I'm joined by Dana Peterson, Chief Economist and Leader of the Economy, Strategy and Finance Center at the Conference Board. So Dana, let's continue our conversation, but let's switch gears a little bit and focus on the economic outlook and particularly economic outlook for the global economy. So what is our outlook for the global economy? If you can flesh that out for us a little bit. Absolutely. It really hasn't changed that month much relative to last month. We're still expecting the global economy to grow by around a little above 3% this year and roughly that, that amount, a little above 3% next year. However, it's still the case that you're going to have a lot of diversity in terms of which economies are really driving that 3% growth rate. It's still the case that Asia, so China, India, ASEAN economies are going to be responsible for much of the growth or the contributions to growth to that 3%. Uh, both in 2024 and in 2025. Um, and among advanced economies, it's still going to be the case that the U.S. is going to more or less outperform most other advanced economies. But even still within those stories, there's a lot of variation. And when you think about, I'm just kind of, you know, just kind of go around the world. I guess you'll you'll probably ask me this. But in terms of the biggest contribution to that 3%, it's still the case that we have China for this year and, and next year. And that's despite the fact that we've seen a lot of bad news come out of China. It's mainly because the government and the central bank are expected to continue to support the economy such that um, China achieves you know, the, the, the prescribed 5% growth rate that um, is desired. So, But that means that there's going to be very uneven growth within the economy. And we can talk a little bit more about that later. So. That's certainly interesting about China. If we're focusing on 
Europe. What's your assessment of Europe? In particular, are there certain economies within the European you know, continent that fall onto different you know, growth trajectories or different tracks? And then, you know, as a European myself, I'm particularly interested in you know, the latest proposal, Mario Draghi's proposal for greater competitiveness and greater growth potential for, for the European Union. What's, what are your views on that? Absolutely. So mainly looking at Western Europe, it's been, you know, kind of a K-shaped recovery from the pandemic where the UK had a bit of a weak spat, but they've caught up. They're doing well. And also it's the case that it's more of the Southern, Southwestern European economies that are doing well, like Spain and Portugal, Italy, but also France is doing very well. Uh, However, Germany has not. And Germany is usually thought of as the engine of growth. Uh, for the European economy, but Germany has been very much impacted by uh, the manufacturing, the global manufacturing slump we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, and it reflects a number of things. It, yes, uh, Germany was very much impacted by the fact that energy prices spiked, so they couldn't run their factories. They're also facing a lot of competition, especially for for vehicles, which <laughs> we're going to talk about and in a, in our window on next week, Alex, um, where they're competing with um, not only U.S. brands, but most, but mainly the, the Chinese brands, and they just can't compete. So given that, we're seeing Germany ver- be very weak, and that's weighing on the overall growth for the euro area as a block and also for Western Europe in general. So meanwhile, you have a bunch of economies that are doing well, but one large economy that's not doing very well. Um, And now it's kind of the sick man of Europe. So we think Germany is probably still going to be somewhat challenged. Now, a couple of weeks ago, Mario Draghi came out with this really great, this uh, really great paper. It was commissioned. And basically he was asked, well, what do we do about the European economy? And he said, well, Europe has two paths. Either Europe can invest in itself and generate greater productivity, or Europe can not. And and not doing that means that Europe's going to fall way behind. um, And basically, it's going to not be able to compete with the US and China, who are kind of the big economies that that, um, are driving a lot of the growth in the world, um, and also have the most influence in the world. So, you know, key things would be, yes, investing in technology and R&D, also investing in, you know, people, talent, ensuring that there's also a lot of integration fiscally because there's a there's no fiscal union right you have the monetary union in in the euro area where you, the ecb determines policy for a bunch of economies but you don't have any combination of i mean you don't have a single body that's directing fiscal policy because all these economies are so different um and also they don't um have like one you know, set of of treasury debt that they could potentially sell. Um, So all those things are super important, um, especially for Europe to compete in this world that's much more technologically advanced, in a world that's greening. They're kind of behind in all these measures. And even and even against that, they're 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 experiencing a shrinking demographic. So yes, Europe is aging, so many people are retiring, but also the young people are leaving. So they're having brain drain. Um, So they need to reverse it. Well, they can't reverse the retirements, but you can certainly reverse the brain train um, and make sure that you're investing in your people, capital, infrastructure, et cetera, in order to accelerate growth. Yeah, I think these are all really important issues for Europe. I mean, some of them have been around for, for decades, right? Some of these structural problems have been around. Some of the fiscal constraints, they have been certainly around since the Maastricht Treaty. There's been all kinds of concerns, but it's good that those are now um, at least brought up in in one proposal or one package of reform, and and hopefully they get picked up and discussed, and and hopefully there's some implementation of beneficial policies. Dana, let's focus briefly on China, which is one of the certainly the the big economic um, players in the global economy. China has received some bad news on the data front lately. What do we think now about the outlook? Yes, China is still being challenged by their ongoing housing crisis and the fact that consumers 
who've lost a lot of wealth due to the housing crisis are not interested in spending. And also, you know, China has been challenged in terms of trade, um, given the weaker, uh, well, I mean, generally moderate growth in the global economy um, among their key trading partners, especially Europe, and also due to ongoing, you know, tr trade and tariff tips um, and tit for tat between the U.S. and also Europe, especially around um, things like metals and and chips and cars and things like that. So the Chinese government has been supporting um, a lot of state-owned enterprises in their efforts to build out the green economy. So that's that that's been that's been a big focus in terms of investing in uh, solar, EVs, and also batteries. But still, now you have huge chunks of the economy that are not doing well. And the government has a 5% target for growth for this year. So um, what's just happened is even as, as of today, there's been a big drive by the government and also the central bank um, to shore up the economy. So for example, the, the PBOC just cut interest rates and also plans to reduce the amount of money banks need to hold on reserve. So if you reduce the reserves that the amount of reserves banks can hold, that means they can lend more, right? Also, there were a number of packages to help shore up the property sector. For example, providing initiatives to um, reduce the cost for carrying a mortgage for consumers um, and even allowing banks to, you know, loosen up some of the interest rates that they're, that they have on, on mortgages and housing. So um, with all those things, like I said, the Chinese government and the PBOC are going to be working together to try to achieve that 5% growth rate. But there's still a lot of concern underneath, and it's going to be challenging for China to transition to a more domestic demand-driven economy if consumers are not or can't participate. So let's round out our conversation here and let's talk a little bit about interest rates. It's on everybody's mind. The Fed acted um, by changing its uh, the short-term interest rate goal by 50 basis points. So what's what's our outlook now for interest rates? How is this going to reflect interest rates um, globally? What are other central banks likely to do? Can you give us the sort of comprehensive global picture of what the, the interest rate environment will likely look like over the next few months or so? Sure, indeed, if you look at um, economies, both emerging markets and advanced economies, the Fed's kind of the last to the game, right? The last of the party. Um, many other central banks, especially emerging markets, have been cutting interest rates. And that's because they hiked interest rates sooner than advanced economies did, and they hiked interest rates to much higher levels. And so that meant that they were kind of the first to tackle inflation in their economies, and then they could re reduce the amount of restrictiveness by cutting interest rates. Um, among advanced economies, like I said, the U.S. is also kind of last to the party because we know that um, the ECB, the Bank of England, a number of other you know, European banks have been cutting interest rates. Um, Japan, on the other hand, um, is having uh, is experiencing inflation probably the first for the first time in almost 50 years. Um, so they're not actually cutting interest rates, but most other economies are cutting interest rates. And the Fed cut rates uh, last week by 50 basis in September by 50 basis points. And I would say that it was kind of, I would call it a hawkish 50 basis point cut. That sounds uh, oxymoronic, but it's because the Fed um, did cut by 50 basis points as its first action, but not because it felt that the economy is in trouble right now, but they want to prevent the realization of downside risks to the labor market. And certainly that comes from the mixed labor market data we've been receiving. And also, you know, the beige book, which showed some pockets of the account of the U.S. cutting hours, right? But you also have to look at where the hours are being cut. It was among kind of the usual suspects in terms of the weaker, uh, which I call the pandemic darling uh, industries that did extremely well during the pandemic when everyone was cooped up at home and interest rates were super low and everyone was buying homes. And when all that reversed, as we normalized a back to an economy where there's a better share of spending on goods and services, they didn't do well. And also, you know, after the Fed hiked interest rates in the banking sector and also heavily, heavily leveraged tech companies don't do well <laughs> with high interest rates. But, you know, other than that, it, there's still there's still a lot of hiring going on, especially in those um, industries that are experiencing labor shortages. 
And the industries that are not hiring or firing are pretty, there are many of them. And they're just kind of holding on to their labor. They're not looking to let people go. And when we look at the unemployment rate, like, yes, it did rise last year, rises over the past year from 3.4% to 4.2%. But when you look at the composition, it's mainly people who are re-entering the labor market or entering the labor market from the first time, not people who were fired, right? Job losers, which is very different from what we saw in the periods just you know right around the 2000 recession and the 2008 recession, very different dynamics in the labor market. So the Fed wanted to get ahead of that. But then they also took great pains to talk about how strong the US economy is. They repeatedly used words like solid for both GDP growth in the labor market. And they're pleased that inflation is heading back to the 2% target, but it's not there yet. Um, so that's why I call it, um, oh, I think a bullish cut, right? Or even a hawkish cut. Um, will they continue to cut interest rates 50 basis points at every meeting? I don't think so. They don't need to do that unless there's some material weakening, weakening that they see in the economy. And so in general, most central banks are going to continue to cut interest rates, but they're doing it. They're very heavily data dependent. So they're deciding, you know, some central banks meet monthly, some every couple of months, but ahead of those meetings, they're looking at all the data. And if they see something that displeases them, then they react either by pausing or going more. But again, this is going to be a gradual process. But I think in general, interest rates are going to fall around the world, but land at levels that are higher than what we saw, what we were used to before the pandemic. And a lot of that's because we have a lot more structural changes throughout the global economy that are putting upward pressure on inflation. And so for central banks to return inflation and stabilize it at their targets or within their target ranges, that means higher interest rates going forward than what we're used to. Right, that's a very good point. The world is just not the same that it was in 2019, and that's also reflected in economic condition. So I think um, you know my listening audience here is going to agree with me that this was a very insightful and interesting conversation. Lena, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely, thank you, Alex. And thank you all for listening to C-Suite Perspectives. I'm Alex Heil, and this series has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You have been listening to C-Suite Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board.